Hi, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. In this video, I'm going to continue my uh, ongoing analysis into an introduction into predicate logic. Um, what I want to do in, uh, in this video is I'm going to discuss how to construct formal proofs of validity in predicate logic. Um, I've gone in previous videos and talked about uh, constructing proofs of validity in various uh, aspects of symbolic logic. In this particular video, what I want to do is to explain how, at least in the introductory explanation, of how you can go about constructing formal proofs of validity in predicate logic. As I said in the last, well, the last series on this introduction to uh, predicate logic, I'm not going to go into how to symbolize um, statements, sentences, propositions. There's a ton of videos on YouTube explaining how to do that. Um, I wanted to contribute something that wasn't already contributed, um, and I didn't really see either few or not very many um, formal proofs of validity. I, I definitely did not see um, proofs of validity for each type of proof of validity. So in this uh, video, uh, we're going to talk. I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to give you an, uh, a demonstration of um, a formal proof of validity for universal instantiation, a formal proof of validity for universal generalization, a formal proof of validity for existential instantiation, a formal proof of validity for existential generalization, a formal proof of validity for um, uh, uh, a conditional proof. So I'm going to go through step by step. Um, existential, universal, both instantiation and generalization, formal proofs of validity, and also um, uh, conditional proof, formal proof of uh, validity for conditional proofs in predicate logic. Um, also, uh, it, it, I wouldn't say that this is necessarily a more advanced video. There's nothing to really be intimidated. I, I think if you've been watching um, my series on symbolic logic, you should um, you should follow along nicely. I think we've sort of uh, we've reached a point in um, the lecture series now that you should be a little comfortable with uh, how to go about constructing these proofs of validity. With that being said, what I'm going to do the banner will pop up. Click the link and it'll take you to. I haven't finished typing it yet, but it'll take you to all the different. And I where's my book? Bye. Um. In the back of, uh, this is the book that I use, this is the book that I was trained on, this is uh, Kopi Symbolic Logic. Um, and what I've done is, in the back of this book, there's, oops, this book's a little old. <laughs> in the back of it, it has all the different um, um, uh, rules for Symbolic Logic. I'll type that up, and you'll be able to download that and use it as uh, a reference, right? Because what you're going to do is, you're gonna, we're going to implement these rules in order to reach um, in order to demonstrate validity, prove that the argument is valid, um, based on the premises we get and the conclusion we're trying to arrive at. Okay, enough talking. Let's uh, let's begin. All right. So this is going to be um, formal proofs. Formal proofs of validity uh, within. Formal proofs of validity within predicate logic. Um, again, I'm going to go through and I'm going to do each. There are one, two, three, four, five different proofs that we'll go through so that you'll have um, just a, a cursory view of what all the different forms of proofs are. Um, these are what are known as technically preliminary proofs. The proofs get um, more complicated as we go along and as I continue this lecture series. Um, uh, we will revisit some of these proofs in its more complex form. Um, in this stage, uh, what's, what's important is just uh, exposure to the proof, and what you'll be able to do then is construct um, your, own, your, own, uh, your own arguments uh, and attempt to prove that they're valid. Or you can look at a, a, an argument in any one of the million logic books and attempt to try and solve it by sort of referencing how you know, I've gone through and, 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 and solved it. Um, I've created these arguments myself, a version of a hybrid account of various problems from various logic books. So uh, with that, let's begin. The first one is universal uh, instantiation. Okay, so the first is universal instantiation, and the abbreviation for 
Universal instantiation is UI. Right? UI is the abbreviation for universal instantiation. And in the last, in the beginning of this series, I think videos one through three or four, something like that, um, and the, one through three, in the beginning of this, I, I explained how um, predicate logic um, statements are read, right? How, how do we read uh, the symbolization of these propositions? Um, so let's imagine that this is our problem. On line one, we have, and this is our premise, we have the following. And then I'll read it. Okay. So this says, for all x, for all x, if, remember, conditional, for all, x, for all x, if x is an A, then x is a B. So that's how that's read. So this is our premise. Premise 1 says, for all x, if, like conditional, if x is an A, then, if then, x is a B. So that's premise 1. Premise 2. Um, okay, premise two for all x and, and if this if you're just starting to watch the series now, jump back to video one in the series and I'll explain sort of what the meaning of the quantification the quantifiers are right, and so on. So for all x, if x is a b, then x is a c. So that's premise two. And then finally, premise three, um, you're given a, y, and then the slash. Therefore, the conclusion we're trying to arrive at is c, y. Okay, so that's all that you're given. Right? This is all we're given. So you are given for all x. If x is an a, then x is a b. Next line. For all x, if x is a b, then x is a c. You're given a y. From this, this, and a y, you have to draw the conclusion, three dots equals therefore, you have to draw the conclusion c y. If we're able to do this, then we've proven that this argument is valid. Okay, so now we're going to begin our um, formal proof, right? So we're going to construct a formal proof of validity for these three premises and arrive at the conclusion C Y to demonstrate that the proof uh, that the argument is in fact valid. So number four is where our proof begins. The first thing that we want to do is we want to recognize that we are going to use our new um, our new rule, right? Our new quantification rule, which is universal instantiation. And maybe in another video, and I probably should have done it before this. I'll I'll, I'll go through sort of. Um, Actually, I think there's a lot of videos on that, but uh, there are rules, conceptual rules, theoretical rules that validate the use of universal instantiation. I can't get into that now. Just, just understand that if you're given the um, symbolized proposition that um, for all x, if x is a, then x is a b, what we want to do is we want to instantiate this universal claim, this generalized claim. Um, all you have to do, and this is very, very simple, right, and I, I, I like to teach it in what I call ghetto philosophy terms, right, all you have to do, very simple, is just take the content between these brackets or parentheses and sort of insert it at this line. There's a whole bunch of theory of why that's justified and how you go about doing it, but none of that's relevant now. So I'm going to just take, um, if, if x is an a, then x is a b, and I'm going to put that here on line four, right, so... It'll be if x is an A, then x is a B. And so I have, what I've done, you can see, I've gotten rid of, and actually it's not x, my bad. Um, part, of, part of the claim, and I guess I do have to go into a bit of the theory. Okay, remember we said that when we talk about um, a claim, and I think the claim was something like, um, you know, Mary knows something, and Ted knows something, and Bill knows something. All of these can be represented individually. But when we want to talk about something in general, we use the subscript X. The subscript X, in very general sense, talk, talks about the scope, right? The scope. Talks about the scope of everything within this universal claim. And one of the things in this universal claim will be Y, right? One of the things in this universal claim will be why. So what I'm doing is I'm instantiating, right? I'm instantiating 
um, a particular uh, variable within the scope, a particular uh, variable within this scope. So while this won't have truth function, remember we said that um, this won't have truth function, this will have truth function. So that's about as much as the theory as I'm going to go into. So um, another point too, just really quick before I go on, we know that our instantiation needs to be y because the clue is we've seen that c has been instantiated by uh, y, right? Um, so that's what we want to do. We want to use y. So um, all I've done is I've brought this down, right? And then I've instantiated. Uh, I've instantiated as y. If this and this uh, this is very introductory, so I, I usually don't spend as much time on this. But I know a lot of people will be watching this video for the first time. If this was an s, and let's say this was an s, right? Imagine that this was an s. This was an S. Let's say it was a P or an R or whatever it was. Then I would instantiate it for that variable, right? I would instantiate it for the variable and so on and so on and so on. This is a particular instantiation of this general claim. But we used Y, so let's maintain the form. So here's a Y, 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 Y. Okay. So what I've done is I've instantiated my generalized claim. And the justification for that is universal instantiation, right? So on line one, I used universal instantiation. And this is the proper notation. Given the premises, new line, this is the first line of my proof of validity for predicate logic. Um, I've universally instantiated this general claim on line one. Okay. Now, number five. Number five, I want to go down to line two. Uh, in line two, we see that we have if, if, uh, no, not if, um, for all x, right, for all x, if x is a b, then x is a c, right? If x is b, x is c. And this can stand for anything, right? It, for me, I, I don't really so much care um, about, you know, what the words mean in this. I, I just want to look at just the raw logic uh, of it all and, and assess the validity of it. So we know what we're going to do, right? We're going to instantiate this, um, this premise, premise 2. And we know that in our instantiation, we're going to use y, right? To, as, as the specific um, variable, which has sort of truth validity to it. So let's instantiate that. So it will be, if y is a b, then y is a c, right? Bx, if, if x is a b, then x is a c. We've instantiated it now. And... Our justification is that we've used our first rule, universal instantiation, on line two. Now we see we're getting closer to this, right? Because here we see we have C, C Y, right? We have this this claim, right? If if uh, if Y is or not it, Y is a C, right? The claim that Y is a C, we have that, and that's what we're trying to arrive at. So in a sense, what you should be thinking is, how do I go about freeing up this? Um, this claim, right? How do I go about removing that from this uh, conditional statement, right? And this is where the use of the rules come into play, right? The, the, more, the more you know the rules, the more you'll recognize immediately how I go about freeing up this, um, this consequence, right? We need to remove this consequence so that it's isolated by itself. If we can remove this consequence and isolate it by itself on its own line, then what we recognize is that we've validated our... our uh, um, predicate logic, uh, or universal instantiation of this claim. So, now we move to 6, right? So, universal instantiation on 1, universal instantiation on 2. The next thing that we recognize uh, immediately, and the reason why I constructed the argument in this fashion, because I thought it would be, it'd be very sort of clear, hopefully, how this is done. You see if we have the form, this has the form, if A, then B, if B, then C, if A then B, if B then C, so we see that we can get if A then C through um, hypothetical syllogism, right? Again, review the rules, you'll see that, right? So we can get a, we can get if A then C through hypothetical syllogism, and to be technical, if Y is an A, then Y is a C, right? So we can do that, right, on line six. So we can have if Y is an A, then uh, Y is a C, 
and we got that from a combination of line 4 and 5, right? If y is an A, then y is a C, C, because B connects both through hypothetical syllogism, right? So it's line 4 and 5, hypothetical syllogism, right? So this line is justified if y is an A, then y is a C, on line 4 and 5, hypothetical syllogism. One quick point, also, is that in solving uh, logical arguments, there's, I wouldn't say an infinity of ways to solve problems, but there are numerous ways that these, these logical problems can be solved. Some, some solutions will be more concise than others. Some solutions might be longer than others. Um, it doesn't really matter how many steps you take to arrive at um, uh, y is a c, but if you get to that claim, then you've validated the argument. Um, the reason why I say that is because there could be any number of steps. I've tried to consolidate the argument as much as possible, but I'll give you just a few versions so that you have an idea of sort of the diversity and the variation that these arguments can have. Okay, so now we're getting now we're getting even closer. Well, what we see is that we have um, if a right, then c, a exact same claim, if a then c, a therefore therefore C, right? If I jump, I will fall. If I jump, I will fall. I jump, therefore I fall, right? Um, and I've done this in, the, I think, the first video on symbolic logic, or one of the videos on symbolic logic, right? Um, this is uh, modus ponens, right? If A, then B, or if P, then Q, P, therefore Q. So on seven, on, on seven, we get CY, which is exactly what we're trying to arrive at, right? And the way that we got it was on line, uh, line um, 6 and 3, right? Line 6 and 3, we use modus ponens, right? So we've concluded our argument. We've, we've, um, I've given you an example of using universal instantiation to prove the validity of the argument um, for all A, I mean for all X, if X is an A, then X is a B. For all X, if X is a B, then X is is a C, and um, uh, Y is an A, right? The conclusion is that Y is a C has been proven because uh, I've been able to, in a sense, deduce and validate the, the truth of this claim. Some of you might not have immediately seen, let's say you, you didn't take note of this, this um, uh, Y is an A here. Could you still have deduced maybe a step or two more. Well, yeah, actually you could have, right? What could you have done? Well, on line six, you'll recognize that you could, you could have done like a material implication, right? Um, and in material implication, I would have gotten um, not A, not Y is an A, or Y is a C. Then I would have had the negation of that, and I can get Y uh, is a C um, by route of material implication. Right, so there, there are many ways that you can go about solving a problem like this. Um, and this is just one example of solving the problem. I think, not I think, my, my intention in presenting you with um, these formal proofs of validity is to expose you to the method of solution so that you can, uh, you can attempt to solve problems of similar form yourself. Okay.